From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, Future Directions of Public Policy. One commentator on the social scene has declared, we managed to muddle our way through the 1970s in spite of ourselves. Another has taken the view that on balance, the 70s gave us 10 years of social progress. Progress, he says, that ought to become a logical basis for giant strides in the 80s. What are the lessons we should have learned in the 70s? Will we build on them, having learned something from our mistakes? Or do we enter the new decade destined to repeat some of the same blunders? In what new directions will the world's leaders take us? How will U.S. public policymakers deal, for example, with inflation? Will it be with us for another whole decade? What lies ahead in health, welfare, housing, the family, education, labor, and criminal justice? Will some of our creaky old institutions, such as Social Security, for example, be revitalized? Or will they merely crumble to be replaced with something quite different? What will the role be of the United States as the 80s move along? Will we, can we regain some of the world leadership of which this nation was once so proud? Or should we even try? An old time philosopher once said, with some considerable validity, it's extremely difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. But that's just what our panel of experts will be doing. Welcome to another public policy forum presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan research and education organization. Today's roundtable discussion will consider the topic, future directions for public policy. Appearing on our panel today are Peter Berger, professor of sociology at Boston College. He is co-director of the AEI Mediating Structures and Public Policy Project. Professor Berger also serves as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and as an associate editor of Worldview, a monthly journal of religion and international affairs. Irving Crystal is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also professor of social thought at the New York University Graduate School of Business. Mr. Crystal is co-editor of the journal The Public Interest. He's a member of the board of contributors of the Wall Street Journal and author of the book Two Cheers for Capitalism. He is also sometimes referred to as the father of neoconservatism. Paul McAvoy is professor of economics at Yale University. He was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors during 1975 and 1976. Professor McAvoy is chairman of the Technical Advisory Committee of the AEI Center for the Study of Government Regulation and is an AEI adjunct scholar. Michael Novak is a resident scholar in religion and public policy at AEI. Previously, he was Ledden Watson Distinguished Professor of Religious Studies at Syracuse University. He is the author of a syndicated newspaper column called Illusions and Reality and is author of a number of noted books of social commentary. John Charles Daly will be moderator for this panel discussion. Mr. Daly is a former head of the Voice of America. He has served as a news correspondent and analyst for CBS News and ABC News and as vice president of the ABC Network. Now, here is Mr. Daly. This public policy forum, part of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, is concerned with the opportunities and the problems of the new decade, the 1980s. Our subject, future directions for public policy. It is our nature and our tradition to look upon the rising sun, a new day, a new year, and particularly a new decade, for we now speak in decades, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, to look upon the decade as an opportunity to pursue with new energy our vision of a good and just society. This public policy forum culminates a two-day period of conferences during which the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research convened its scholars together with involved experts of the public policy community to assess the public policy decisions of the 1970s 
and to reflect on the public policies our people and nation wish to or should pursue in the 1980s. The scholars with us for this discussion, all affiliated with the AEI, have actively participated in the two-day conference. To give perspective to so broad a subject, <coughs> we will tend to focus on the economy, domestic policy, the state of America's institutions, and foreign affairs. So Professor Crystal is a member of the Board of Contributors of the Wall Street Journal and author of the recent book, Two Cheers for Capitalism. Will you take a look at the economy? Can the policies of the past meet the challenge of the 1980s? Uh, if you mean the policies of the recent past, the obvious answer is no. It was George Will who called the 1970s a decade of second thoughts. And if you start the 1970s with the end of Watergate, 74, I think that's a fair description. And I expect the 1980s to continue that process of second thinking in which the ideas and enthusiasms and illusions, I would say, of the 1960s are rectified, as the Chinese would say. Professor McAvoy is a professor of economics at Yale University. How say you on public policy and the economy? John, I would like to, to install as my first set of remarks everything Irving Kristol just said. And I will try to attain that level of brilliance uh, and fail in the next few minutes. In a room full of economists, uh, perhaps uh, uh, 30 in number, we had 300 answers to your question. The sum total of the answers was fairly universal agreement that public policy was affecting the economy far more than the economy was changing or improving public policy. By that, we meant that public policy with respect to, to expenditures, uh, production, <coughs> of the federal government and with respect to monetary issues was creating inflation in the economy to a very significant ex extent. Indeed, there may be causes to generate new federal policy with respect to monetary and fiscal affairs, but it was ultimately the increase in the money supply and in federal expenditures which created the economy-wide inflation. Public policy across a wide variety of programs also has created a real slowdown in productivity and in the growth of the economy. These may be regulatory policies requiring investments that are not productive of new output they may be tax policies. Uh, they may be expenditure policies, which replace investment with consumption. But the sum total of a wide variety of particular policies for specific sectors of the economy is that these policies have slowed down the growth and development of the United States economy. One would expect that these adverse effects more inflation, less growth, would lead to some change in public policy. But it's at that point that we leave the 1970s and enter the 1980s because we did not see any improvement in public policy as a result of the bad behavior of the economy yet. Professor Berger, let's turn to the general area of domestic policy and our institutions. Can we be both more responsive to human needs and more particularly human desires and at the same time meet increasingly urgent demands for more efficiency and more effectiveness from our policies in the 1980s? I think that what has happened in, in domestic policies and has a curious uh, parallel, I think, in foreign policy is that uh, public policy, particularly as fashioned in, in Washington, represents values and viewpoints on the world which are at considerable distance from those of the majority of the American people. 
And I think that one of the foremost imperatives of public policy in the 1980s is for government, for public policy, to show more respect for the values of the American people and for the institutions that represent these values. And I think this cuts across really all the issues you mentioned that we discussed uh, here. Uh, most of the American people believe in enterprise. Uh, government carries on policies which are detrimental to enterprise. Most of the American people believe in institutions through which they themselves express their values and identity, such as the church, the family, the neighborhood. Many government policies are detrimental to that. And most Americans are very patriotic and uh, believe in a strong international posture of the United States. And uh, the foreign policy establishment of this country uh, has a lot of people in it who feel very apologetic about America and would like to see a very soft-footed stance in the world. So I think this cuts across really all the issues we've been talking about. All right, Professor Novak is author of the syndicated column, Illusions and Realities. What are the realities of the 1980s in the foreign affairs field? The realities are, I'm afraid, that uh, we are facing the most dangerous era in our history. And the advantage of the 1970s have been that we've had an opportunity to see through at least some of our illusions about the world. We began the decade with a treatise aimed at our elite predicting the greening of America. We ended the decade with a profound fear on the part of many people in the world as well as here that we were seeing the yellowing of America, that America would be unable and unwilling to fulfill its worldwide responsibilities. One of the illusions that has been penetrated is that whereas we thought we were engaged in detente with the Soviet Union, we have come to discover that the Soviet Union has been spending on its military budget far in excess of our spending, that that spending has had offensive weaponry uh, in mind and in fact, that those great expenditures grow every year more obsolescent, that is the opportune time for their use is in the near future, that the Soviet leadership will be facing a basic change uh, probably to a younger and more aggressive leadership, that the Soviet Union will be in more dire need of oil than we are beginning in the middle. 80s, and that the Soviet Union is already practicing a very activist international policy. And then we had the illusion of the third world, that it, the third world was interdependent with us. And we said that in a friendly, fraternal tone of voice. And then Iran showed that that could be a very unfriendly and hostile and rude uh, interdependence. We thought the third world was poor, but a good part of it is very rich. We thought of the third world as one, and we've discovered that there are many third worlds. So we enter the 80s, I think, with a, a greater realism, uh, fortunately, because uh, all the realism we can draw upon is going to be needed for a very dangerous time. All right, Professor Crystal, and this really is directed to each of you in the four areas on which we focus, the economy, domestic policy, America's institutions, and foreign affairs. What are the most significant lessons of the 1970s, and what is the most pressing public policy problem for the new decade? Let me answer another question, which you haven't asked yet. That's good. Um, <laughs> as I look back on the discussions we've been having these past days, I think it's fair to say that the majority of the scholars, economists, political scientists, sociologists, theologians, were quite pessimistic about the world we were going to live in in the course of the 1980s. It is going to be a very hard world. Uh, energy is going to be a big problem. Uh, the international order seems to be generally collapsing. Uh, destabilization, as one calls it now, no longer has to be caused by anyone. It seems to be self-propelled in nation after nation. In addition, we face serious economic problems at home as a result of our past mistakes. We faced a, a galloping inflation. Uh, we faced, we have productivity that is far too low. Uh, we face increasing competition from other nations and all sorts of economic areas. All of these things, I think, are, at least from our present vantage point, undeniable. Where the scholars divided, 
was in their estimate as to how the American people would react to these facts and how the American government would react. I was among the more optimist, among the more optimistic. I think the American people and the American government will react sensibly. And I think that the old adage about the uses of adversity might be proved once again. Uh, I think we have gone through a decade of utopian enthusiasms. That was the 1960s and the early 1970s. Uh, we believed we were living in something called an age of affluence, if not an age of Aquarius. Uh, that is, the only problem left was the distribution of wealth, not the creation of wealth. Uh, and the only problem in foreign affairs was goodwill rather than wicked will. Uh, and we have learned that this is not the way the world is, not the way the world works. And I think the American people have learned it. I'm not sure that all the politicians have yet learned it, but many show signs of in being on a learning curve. Well, let's stay on this issue. Do you feel that, for instance, the, the uh, crisis of the hostages in Iran and the closing hours of the 70s inspired a, a renewal of conviction, values, and, and direction in the American people? Yes no, McAvoy. It seems that uh, He's we a jail. have. How would he know? <laughs> That's a very good question. It makes it easier to answer. In, you in sound the like a Harvard man. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> the <clears throat> the rallying around of uh, the the body politic, the citizens of the country of this country to. Uh, a strained, if not crisis, international situation is very impressive. It shows a resiliency that uh, uh, I had not uh, seen in some years. And uh, indeed, uh, I'm encouraged uh, somewhat along the lines that uh, Irving Crystal is encouraged with respect to our ability to respond. But that's only one instance, John. We are still missing from the experts a means by which we can see our way clear to either coincidental or simultaneous energy, economy, and national security crises. And until we do find a way of, uh, of bringing these crises together in our thought patterns, I am not likely to be as optimistic as Irving concerning the results. That we may have two or three crises, we lose three million barrels of oil, we have a political disruption in the Middle East, and the economy is uh, uh, ready for another slowdown, where the combination can be a multiple effect of the three. We're taking the question with the thrust of the ability of the American people to respond. What do you say to that, Professor Berger? Well, I'm sorry, but I want to add another crisis, uh, which um, uh, is the crisis in values, or if you will, the crisis of the American self-image, uh, which cuts right across the crises that uh, McAvoy has just mentioned. Let, let me tell you a brief episode. Uh, oh, about three years ago, I talked with an Austrian diplomat whom I know, uh, who is extremely well informed. Uh, Austrian diplomats are particularly well informed because they always talk to Romanians, and the Romanians <laughs> are totally informed, I've discovered. By the Hungarians. Uh, <laughs> no, not by the Hungarians. No, the Hungarians ask the Romanians. Uh, but um, uh, in any case, I was talking with this friend of mine about uh, what everyone in Central Europe worries about, which is the future of Yugoslavia after Tito goes. And it's a big worry what will happen in Yugoslavia with all kinds of apocalyptic possibilities. And uh, my friend, who's very, very pro-Western, said, well, uh, Yugoslavia borders on two NATO countries, Italy and Greece. And the United States, if worst comes to worst, will just have to send in troops into Croatia from uh, Italy and troops into southern Yugoslavia from Greece. And turned to me, expecting me to agree. And I said, I should say this was two or three years ago. Uh, I said, well, are you sure that American troops will fight uh, to save whatever regime in Yugoslavia? And he stopped, and the question obviously had not occurred to him. Now, I am an, an amateur with regard to economic, diplomatic, and military policies that should or should not be pursued. But I am quite certain of the relevance to all of these 
of the American value crisis. I don't think there is any easy uh, crisis in values. Let me say again, this, this amounts to a crisis of consciousness, a, a crisis of how we as a people view ourselves. I wish I had uh, an easy recipe in this area. I think the events uh, in and around Iran are too recent. It is too early to say what will be the outcome of this, and it would be nice if one could be optimistic. But I think one thing that is relevant to this, uh, this image, self-image, self-consciousness, are domestic policies in all aspects uh, of the welfare state, particularly those that affect people's values and meanings. Uh, in terms of uh, particularly the foreign posture of the United States, I think to put it very simply, uh, we are a society of which the American people can be proud, not uncritically, but basically proud. Does our image in the world reflect this fact? Does public policy uh, reflect this fact? Now, as far as the welfare state is concerned, I think we have in the United States a very distinctive distinctively American possibility of creating models of a humane uh, welfare state, which is far superior to anything uh, in Western Europe, for example. Sweden, I think, is usually taken as a perfect paradigm of the welfare state, and I'm not professionally anti-Swedish, but I think what we can create in the, sometimes I'm privately anti-Swedish, but not professionally. Um, I think what we can create in America, and to some extent have already created, is distinctively superior. Uh, not only in terms of, of uh, its efficiency, but in terms of the humaneness of our institutions. I think much more uh, can be done along these lines. Now, I think I must add in all honesty that no public policy that I can imagine can overcome the fundamental crisis I put on the table along with the other crisis already on it. Because at its roots, uh, this is a spiritual crisis, and the human spirit is not a very easy target uh, for public policy. But at least one can ask that uh, government uh, does not interfere with those impulses in the society and those institutions in the society that have a chance of dealing with the crisis of values. Professor Novak. The uh, problem uh, that Peter is addressing arises, I think, because in the 1960s and the 1970s, uh, we expanded enormously the elites of the United States, the number of people with at least four years college, the number of people with an income. Uh, now the top 10% is uh, somewhere around the $27,000 a year per household range, and with high status as managers or professionals. Uh, a full 10% of our population falls in that category now. Uh, this compares, for example, to 1939 when we had 900,000 students in colleges or universities, approximately now 13 million. That expanded elite also began to divide in the 1970s. That is to say, there was the old elite whose interests lay in the private sector and its energy and expansion, and now we have a new road to wealth and power which is through identification of one's own interest with those of the state. And perhaps half of our elite now has interests that lie in the status direction. And the third factor I think that is important is that our top 10% has become increasingly separated from the other 90% of the people. There is not an easy connection between the values, the energies, the aspirations of ordinary people in their many diverse uh, localities across this country. And the statement of public policy that comes through our public institutions, that comes through the media in particular, why is that? It's partly because the reporters now, and in, in, uh, in general those who, uh, the analysts who give us our picture of ourselves, are now themselves from the top 10% by education, by income, and by status. And they tend to give a picture back of this country that reflects better them uh, than the people. Uh, we have got to find a way, I think, on all the questions uh, that we're talking about, to make a more vivid connection between ordinary people everywhere and the definition of our of our public policy. Well, do you consider that the old accepted rule of thumb of my youth, which uh, of course was not universal, but shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations has passed from the American scene, that the elite become elite and remain elite? Well, no, not that. I mean, there is some hope for thinking that all those kids who are out demonstrating against nuclear energy in their Gucci uh, boots and so forth are not, meanwhile, working hard at their studies and creating room at the top uh, for somebody else. I mean, who pays their airplane ticket to get them to the demonstrations? Uh, as they lose the ability to pay it for themselves, 
there's their going parents, to be a circulation. I regret to say. Their parents' play is, is right. But there will be room at the top for still others. But meanwhile, uh, the point I only want to make is that we have a recently ascendant elite whose who, uh, who's, uh, uh, favorite images of the counterculture were to spell America with a K and to regard as the greatest enemy of uh, peace and justice in the world the policies of the United States. I heard a young man say just yesterday, why do we spend, uh, why do we spend so much energy defending the most reactionary regimes of the world? And he meant, uh, for example, the, uh, the Shah of Iran. But uh, one begins to compare. Com compared to whom? Uh, compared to Khomeini? Uh, compared to the rulers of Iraq or Syria in the immediate vicinity or to any other rulers? Uh, and uh, is the regime which followed the Shah less reactionary? And you go around the world in that way. Uh, and uh, and th these questions, I think, have been uh, too absent for a time. And many American people, good people, have been intimidated by the constant accusation. Yeah, Mike, uh, I, I think everything you say is true, but I think that's the 1970s. I, I'm certain, I'm certain, but I can't prove it, obviously, that the 1980s are going to be very different. Uh, I think one of the things we have learned, and it came as a rather shocking surprise to most of us, as it certainly did to me, is that this democracy, and indeed all modern industrial democracies, is more threatened by affluence than it is by recession or adversity. We do not cope well with affluence. We tend to immediately fly off into the wild blue yonder and to make the most grotesquely utopian assumptions about the world and its possibilities. Now, I think what has happened in the course of the 1970s is that the American people and a good part of the elites you refer to have become more conservative, or to use a term I, w I am rather fond of, neoconservative, which I am supposed to be. Uh, the people who coined the term did not particularly mean it to be flattering, uh, but I think it's a pretty good term, and I define it as a neoconservative as a liberal who has been mugged by reality. <laughs> and I think this is what happened in the course of the 1970s. Reality mugged us all. Uh, reality imposed itself upon us. And uh, you know, it imposed itself upon the White House last of all, but then the White House always is the last to know. But the American people have responded. And I got my first intimation of this at the time of the bicentennial celebration when you saw these uh, young people, young girls, carrying their babies in papoose packs, wearing blue jeans, singing the stars and stripes forever. Uh, I didn't even know they knew the words. I didn't know they even knew the song existed. But there they were singing it. And I got a sense then that the tide had begun to turn. And I think as a result of the events in the Middle East, we are witnessing in this country the rise of a new nationalism. I think uh, there'll be a much stronger sense of communal solidarity. Uh, there'll be many problems. There will be all the crises that Paul McAvoy referred to. I mean, every one of, it's going to be a hard decade. But what gives me hope is the fact the American people seem to be a lot more prepared to cope with this decade than they were with the 1960s, which, at least in the earlier part, was not a hard de decade at all. Well, Irving, I, I, I feel we should be, we should not make too many predictions that we might regret in all this oh, public. Oh, people forget, it's all right. But uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know whether the tide is turning or not. I hope you are right. But I, I, I would like, as of now, I would like to say something a little different uh, to Mike than you did. Uh, I think the, the, the people who like to spell America with a K, that is not the dominant mood anymore. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in the areas of public policy. These are not people in the State Department, HEW, very few of them. And I think what you find is something that at first looks more uh, harmless, but perhaps is more insidious. And it just occurs to me that we need a new term, and that's the neo-counterculture, uh, which is a much uh, softer version of it. That's uh, Romanian. They are not saying. <laughs> All intellectual terms are Romanian. Uh, the, um, uh, well, I want counterculture. Uh, I think what one finds is something, and, and you find it in all the areas we're talking about, certainly in foreign affairs. It's not that America is fascist and uh, Mao is China is wonderful. It's something more nuanced, but also very dangerous. It's always giving the benefit of the doubt 
to what seems to be a revolutionary movement. Okay? It's always assuming, at least as a possibility, that the friends of the United States are the worst. Uh, it's terribly important, a fundamental intellectual failure to understand the difference between an authoritarian and totalitarian society. Now, these are softer themes than the late 60s and the early 70s, but I think they're very insidious. But the, the point I wanted to make... In Romania, we call it insidious, right. <laughs> the, the, the point I wanted to make is that uh, both you and Irving argue that the, uh, the iron is hot and that there's a change at work, with which I'm in total agreement. But I don't think that, th that, that it has been shaped yet. I don't think that those channels have been created. All this good feeling, all this good turning toward greater reality might come to naught. We don't, for example, I think, at the moment, have a political expression of it. We have neither a party nor a set of candidates who represent the sort of view uh, that we uh, are here talking about. I think all the candidates are, uh, are representing it in one way or another. Uh, even uh, Mr. Je Mr. Brown, Governor Brown, uh, in certain respects, the constitutional amendment for, to limit government spending does reflect that changing mood. Uh, it's not a, I think it's finding political expression the way these things find political expression in this country by sort of filtering up and coloring everyone's rhetoric and coloring everyone's policies. Uh, I, I, I think even on economic policy, which is in a way the hardest policy because there we get into group and class conflicts, there is a new appreciation uh, of the need for economic growth and a far less emphasis on the importance of economic redistribution. I think that is as much to be found in the Democratic Party now as in the Republican Party. But it's yet to be achieved. I mean, the changes in policy which would make investment conditions more favorable, which would take the government out of the universities to a greater degree and so forth, those things are yet to be ach achieved. There is a sea change in opinion, but there is not yet the imagination of the laws or the organization of the institutions which could really effectively turn the tide. And that makes always possible, I think, a restoration of that earlier move. Yeah. I think you know, the phrase that may be throwing us off a bit is turning the tide. Look, we're not going to go back to the 19, early 1950s, to the Eisenhower era. One, one never goes back. The counterculture will, in a sense, to some degree, remain. It'll become stylized, it'll become commercialized, as it already has. It will become co-opted, Hollywood will take it over, and it'll become a part of popular culture, and one hopes will be tamed and made to accommodate uh, traditional American values. The accommodation may not be all that easy, but in a free society, these things can and do happen, and the potential, the power of a free society to take a hostile idea and castrate it while accepting it should not never be underestimated. Uh, and uh, some of the radicals, incidentally, understand this very well, very well indeed. And I think that's what's happening. I mean, there are many going to be aspects of American life in the 1980s that those of us of a certain age and a certain background are not going to like. But then there were certain things in the 1950s I didn't much like either. Take one theme, though, that came up in our meetings again and again, namely the theme of mediating institutions or mediating structures. That is, those parts of life which are intermediate between the individual on one hand and the state on the other. Things, uh, institutions like the family, the neighborhood, the church, the union, the corporation, and so forth that, uh, that uh, Peter already mentioned. While there's beginning to be a body of thought about how important these uh, organs are in any healthy society, um, there really is not yet much imagination about how to avoid harming these uh, basic institutions, minimally, uh, or on the other hand, about how to provide a way for strengthening them, for encouraging them, which doesn't either corrupt them or make them even more dependent on the state or, or uh, some other institution. Well, you Professor Berger, you're thing, chairman, me. To, to remind me again, you are chairman of the project examining mediating structures. So give us your view as to. But I'd rather talk about something else at the moment, because otherwise I'd get <laughs> oh, involved in a scholastic. <laughs> I, I, I'd get involved in a scholastic discussion as to what are mediating structures and what are not. I, I wanted to say something else, if I may. I yeah, don't want to avoid do. the subject. Please do. It seems to me that the conversation right now between uh, particularly Mike and, and, and Irving Crystal is, is you know, the, 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 the continuing potency of the countercultural themes. And, and I think one thing one might hope for 
and there are certain economic forces perhaps that lead to this, is a certain privatization of these themes. In other words, what uh, you are referring to, Irving, in terms of what we may not like very much, are certain private mores, uh, which, uh, who likes what one's neighbors do anyway? I mean, I, so th they may have some, uh, perhaps, uh, sexual taste that I don't appreciate, or what I find much worse, because I can hear it, the musical taste, and things of that sort. Uh, but as long as this stays out of, the, of public policy, I think we can live with this. And that is uh, perhaps a realistic goal. Well, let's perhaps come to grips I might with... add just yeah, a, please do. an injection of uh, fresh politics at this stage, too. Many of the, of the, of the wishes or, or goals or aspirations of uh, friend Crystal can be achieved with changes of operations of existing organizations, mediating structures, even federal and state agencies or boards or bureaus, even elected presidents. We can uh, turn around the important uh, economy-wide policies of inflation and economic growth without a significant change in institutions. If we have a presidency, which is an organization now, with the will to set out a five-year balanced federal budget and the will to, to use the influence of the White House on monetary policy to restrain the growth of money supplies that is obtained through Federal Reserve Board policies. We need not change institutions. However, if we want to improve the growth performance of our economy, the productivity growth, if we want to create significant new jobs and opportunities for entrepreneurs, for people with new ideas, we're going to have to change regulations. We're going to have to reduce the licensing authority of the state board. We're going to have to do things with uh, housing regulations, with uh, uh, regulations on the production of new goods and services throughout the economy that require changing institutions. That whole vast body of agencies that lie between an elected president and the people, mediating structures created by uh, governments to do their work at the local level will have to be, in good part, put back to where they were in the 1950s if we're going to have the changes he wants in the 1970s. And he has told me 30 times that regulatory reform proceeds at an inch a year, and over a decade you may get as much as three yards. So I doubt whether he can do what he wants to do within the existing institutions on part of his program. But, but in I, the closing you know, hours I, of 1970, me. we had deregulation of the airlines, yes, we had the FTC issue right. brought up. Well, so there is the a FTC speeding thing up, is really right? quite important. Uh, the deregulation of the airlines uh, was, a, as with trucking, uh, as with railroads, is a complicated matter. You're talking about uh, a specific older kind of regulation not the newer social kind of regulation, which has really imposed the most tremendous costs upon the economy as a whole. Give an as example. Against, well, OSHA or Environmental Protection Agency. EPA. Yes, right. which has imposed costs not on one industry, but on the economy as a whole. And you're right. We are going to make very slow progress uh, against those uh, excesses of regulation. On the other hand, uh, it was Adam Smith who said, uh, a market economy can withstand a thousand impertinences of government. Didn't say a million, but he said a thousand. Uh, I think if you get that inch every now and then, the market economy will figure out a way to cope with these regulations. Already, it really is extraordinary. The achievements, uh, and much uh, undervalued, indeed quite ignored, the achievements of the uh, business community in coping with these regulations, which if one had described them 10 years ago in a class in economics, one would have assumed to simply drive them all out of business completely. But they are very ingenious people, they're very hardworking people, and they've managed to 
not live with them comfortably, they're living with them painfully, and they are indeed excessive, and something has to be done to reduce their costs, and something will to be done will be done to reduce their costs, but uh, a few inches at a time and a few yards at a time, and at the end of the 1980s, I think we'll, our economy will be in much better shape. Well, I asked what was the most pressing public <laughs> policy problem of the new decade, and I guess the answer is there's no most. They're all rather pressing, and that there are a great many of them. Let's come to grips with specific concepts. How much is our dependence on foreign energy sources, Professor McAvoy, going to shape our future? It's going to be a very important part of our future, John. This is the classic public policy problem of the decade because it offers the full range of opportunities to do very well and very poorly. If we start with what will happen in the market economy, the world oil market economy of uh, Irving Crystal's description, I believe that analysts have to come down to a position where both because of engineering and technical conditions in the production of oil and because of political conditions, we will have each year one or two percent less oil than we had the year before. All it takes is a political disruption in one Middle Eastern country, uh, a, a surprise find that the decline curve that the exploitation of oil has taken us further and there's water in the field, any of these conditions will give you a couple percentage points reduction in world supply. The world's demand grows at 4 or 5 percent a year because of population growth, because people obtain higher levels of income, as Dr. Novak mentioned. They have higher aspirations. They will consume more in the developing countries. So that each year that we have a couple percentage points less, we'll have five percentage points more demand. In order to clear the market of the excess demand, now five, six, seven percentage points, prices on average are going to have to go up 20 to 30 percent a year. That's every year in a normal year. There'll be abnormal years. Well, against that, that says that over the next decade, we ought to get a 200 to 300 percent increase in the price of world oil. That is our challenge for these vibrant citizens that Irving and the rest of us have described. And we can do one of two things. <coughs> we can attempt to maximize our domestic production to add to those supplies, and we can attempt to conserve the maximum amount possible so as to reduce that press of demand. How do you factor in synthetics? Oil from coal, oil from shale? That is a way of adding to the supplies of domestic oil with a substitute that you won't be able to tell the difference between with respect to oil. You, it will burn in your, in your uh, I, I presume you now have a, a two-cylinder, uh, 12 horsepower, yes. a former lawnmower that you drive to the office. With a hole in the floor so I yes. can also use yes. my feet. Yes, you're, you're, you're conservative with respect yes, to energy, sir. which I applaud. And under those conditions, the additional supply of synthetics will play an important role towards the end of the decade. Well, that's policy A. That is our challenge, and that's the positive policy. In order to do that, we must eliminate the regulations of prices because that's the most effective force for conservation. It makes people think about what they conserve, uh, what they consume. It makes people work against uh, 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 very important limits on their budgets to carry out conservation. And it adds the maximum amount available to domestic supplies of both the synthetics and the orthodox fuels. That policy opportunity of eliminating regulations in that area has its alternative of continuing the present Department of Energy controls. The Department of Energy controls over the last five years have added a couple million barrels a day to demand and reduced supply by a million barrels a day. So a continuation of those controls can only add to the press of world demands and reduce the world supplies even more than my baseline prediction. Whether we choose policy A or policy B, 
is a matter that legally comes up in the next year or two. There will be a tremendous furor in Congress. They'll spend a year on it. In the process of spending a year on it, they will not do damage elsewhere in the economy, so that's good. <laughs> but in the process, they may very well decide on A or B. And frankly, I don't have the ability to predict as to whether they take the positive or the negative road. That's the challenge of the decade as far as American policy concerns uh, the economy. Right, let's turn to, to um, an issue that we said we would look at, which is foreign affairs. How do you see the role of the United States on the world stage in the 80s? Do we have the national will to lead uh, commensurate with our wealth and our inherent power? Who wants to start with that one? How about you, Professor Novak? That's one of the issues that's uh, still in doubt. I think we were very lucky that the challenge, the first really vigorous challenge to us came from Iran, rather than, let us say, in Yugoslavia with the Soviet Union or in a rebellion in Poland. I'm just back from 10 days in Poland, and uh, talk of an imminent rebellion there is, uh, is very powerful. Um, we're lucky that we were tested in Iran first, and we're lucky that the people coalesced behind it. We're lucky that the president found the Iran as a pretext for saying he wanted a 5% real increase in the military budget for every year for the next, I think he said, uh, four years. And uh, uh, I don't think apart from Iran that would have happened, and the people would be so unanimously behind it, and I think the other politicians will, will come in uh, uh, behind it. All that means that we again have a chance uh, to uh, alter our course, at least by a little. But one has to be a bit skeptical yet whether we will. There are important forces uh, who will try to undermine that and take us back into the mood that we have been in for the last 10 years. And whether we can actually execute it is uh, to be decided. Anybody else want to talk to that point? If not, Professor Berger, with your permission, let us briefly, to be sure, go back to mediating structures, which as I understand from reading your, your works on it and your chairmanship of the project, consist of that vast conjuries of important elements of our lives, our church, our family, etc. Do you see them having a more effective place in the 80s than you have indicated, at least in what you've said they had in the 70s? Or do you see less government domination of, of the mediating structures? Well, let, let me emphasize again how I see this connected with the general theme of this discussion. I, in my response to your first question, I said I, I would like to see public policy more respectful of the values of the American people and the institutions that embody these values. Now, take uh, the church as an example, organized religion. Now, minimally, it seems to me, and it's a very minimal expectation, public policy should not prevent uh, these institutions from continuing doing certain things which they are doing. For example, education. Uh, now, we have in the courts now for several years uh, uh, a number of, of cases and in the federal courts and in the state courts uh, where government uh, uh, education, state education departments in what seems to me a demented way have been trying to impose their dominance over certain religious schools. Uh, most of these cases, as far as I know at the moment, are in the South, and most of the schools are evangelical Protestant schools. I think it's very important to point out that, as far as I am aware, in none of the important cases is there any issue of race. In other words, everyone stipulates that these are not the, these little schools that came up to avoid desegregation. They are schools operated by evangelical Protestants who want to teach their children in a setting which expresses their religious values. That's not some little sect. I mean, it's not like the Amish case uh, up there in Iowa a few years ago. These are millions of Americans. The estimate is not accurate, but perhaps between 30 and 40 million of the American people belong to this community of value. I don't. I have no stake in this personally. I have a stake, however, in government not running roughshod over the values of millions of fellow Americans. Now, what's, I think, terribly important, quite apart what, from what one thinks about religion per se, and I think, I said before, I think the crisis is ultimately religious, uh, uh, spiritual, or the values for most human beings in the end are religious values. But even if one does not share this opinion and has, is a sort of uh, tolerant agnostic, one would have to, which is, very few Americans are not at least tolerant agnostics. I mean, there's an infinitesimally small group of militant 
atheists and anti-church people who have an absolutely disproportionate effect on the courts, which is very interesting in itself. But that's another story. So even from the point of view of the tolerant agnostic, I think it's very important to point out that these schools on the whole do a very good educational job. What is the state trying? Teaching, writing, reading, and arithmetic. Never mind their evangelical theology. Now, what is the state trying to do? To force these schools to become like the public schools, which in most of the country are an unspeakable mess. Now, as public policy, I think this is, I would use the phrase again, demented. And this dementia has a lot to do, I think, with the crisis of values that I've been talking about. An economist. Uh uh, concern or, or uh, forecast, mediating structures in, in the work of Peter Berger and others are these organizations that lie between the individual and <coughs> government, and they attempt to ameliorate the harshness and impersonality of the delivery of government services. They do this well in a variety of circumstances from his case studies. On the other hand, you can become concerned that in the 1980s, the mediating structures, as they succeed, become themselves government agencies. And because they are successful products of the local community, become a powerful political force for the perpetuation of that government program. Now, John, just three minutes ago, I was trying to balance the federal budget. And I hope that the growth of these burgeoning ameliorative organizations doesn't give us a $60 billion deficit again. <coughs> so I've got a few worries back in the Well, but the I would corner. like to say, uh, Paul, that, that while uh, this is a legitimate worry, and we, you and I have discussed this, uh, I think in the case I mentioned, this doesn't enter into it at all. Didn't say it did. We're in the uh, 1980s. That's We're in the 80s, Peter. We're not back in the medieval 70s. Yes, sir. Um, my name is uh, Robert Pranger, and I direct foreign policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, or AEI, as it says behind this panel. Now, my question to the panel basically is, what, from your standpoint, is the role which uh, ideas and intellectuals ought to play in the 1980s in the realm of public policy? Uh, yeah, I would make a distinction between that, uh, a, the class of intellectuals and the class of experts. Uh, obviously, in the conduct of economic policy, you would like some economists around to give you whatever guidance and counsel they can. Uh, I would not particularly want an, an, an economist to be in charge of economic policy. Uh, but I do think that uh, it's useful to have economists around so that politicians can talk with them uh, and get all of their varying opinions. I think similarly on foreign policy, it's very useful, obviously, to have experts in a particular part of the world on international economics or these days on armaments. Uh, when you go into disarmament negotiations. Uh, so that there is, and I think must be, a role, consultative role, for the expert in domestic policy and in foreign policy. But you know, it's interesting, they don't really function there as intellectuals in any traditional sense of the term. They function as experts. But I, on the whole, don't like the idea of these people conducting policy. I think they must be kept in a subordinate position because they do tend to think in very abstract ways about the real world. Uh, and they do tend to have very rationalistic conceptions of political, social, and economic reality. They do tend to have too much confidence in their own analyses and not enough good, solid gut instinct as to what is the right way to go. So there's a role for these people, but not, I would think, uh, a top role. Taking the, the economic policy role seriously, over the last 10 years, I would surmise that our governments have been disappointed, that the counsel and advice that has come from uh, uh, the universities, the White House, and, and uh, 
Our congressional staff uh, has been uh, uh, unfortunately not canceling, uh, that there have been dominant themes. They have mostly been in error. They've led to uh, worsening the situation. And the consumers of that sort of advice, I believe, have learned widely and well to be very cautious. It's almost in the tradition of a true story that's told about President Ford and Alan Greenspan, his economic advisor, at a lunch uh, early in, Mr. in President Ford's administration, he looked up and asked, where's Alan Greenspan? And his aide said, I do not know. Shall I find him and bring him here? And Mr. Ford said, no, no. Just tell me where he is. Don't bring him here. <laughs> <laughs> I appeared with uh, Professor Crystal a little over two years ago on another forum, and I can't resist sharing with you what he had to say on that occasion because it's so uh, germane to what we're talking about. That time he said, the point is the economy of our country is in the hands of professionals who do not know what to do, but nevertheless have the only professional authority to do anything. And then he added, I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said, that it was only after 1905 that doctors started to do more good than harm to their patients. <laughs> so that I think well, there's a mix of that in what you've all yes. had to say. We're Actually, uh, intellectuals in public policy are at their best when they show why and how public policies don't work. They really are at their best when they're critics. They're not all that good at coming up with positive Mm -hmm. policies. The record there is, to put it very uh, gently, very spotty. This concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our hearty thanks to the distinguished and expert panelists, Professors Peter Berger, Irving Crystal, Paul McAvoy, and Michael Novak. And our thanks also to our guests and experts in the audience for their participation. This public policy forum on future directions for public policy has brought us the views of four experts in the field. It was presented by AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by so doing, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. I'm Peter Hackus in Washington. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, DC. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.